Glory is the title of the uh, lesson for today. Um, and some of you may have seen the email that Josh sent out. And I want to explain a little more how I got onto this topic. Um, over the past year and a half, I've actually known uh, a large number of, of, of people who actually passed away, most from cancer. Um, and I actually created a list and I counted uh, this, this number of people um, pretty much over the last three years and it numbered 13. That's not counting the number of people who I know who knew someone who passed away or had someone close to them pass away. That actually pushes a number to over 20. And then if we add the people I know who know someone who is either suffering from an illness or someone I know myself is suffering from an illness, that pushed the number up to way over 30. And, and I spent this summer questioning why this was, why this was happening. Um, why these things were happening to me specifically and to the people that I know. Um, and, and I told one of my friends, his name is Brennan, that uh, I felt like the Highlander. Um, and, and Michael probably knows that reference. And it, the Highlander was a, a TV show in the 1990s. Um, and it was inspired by a movie. And the basic premise is that there's these immortal swordsmen and women uh, who duel with each other until there's only one of them left and the last one gets to claim the prize. And the prize is that they can age and that they can have children. But the, the entire series was based around one character named Duncan MacLeod who was 400 years old and over that time of the series, he sees people he knows who, who are, um, his, uh, he, he's, he has companionship and fellowship, but he sees those people eventually pass away and yet he continues on, never aging, um, and always experiencing in his in his eyes grief and I I latched onto the show because most of you know that I, I studied Japanese swordsmanship for like 20 years and and so I have a fascination with swordplay but what I found out is that a lot of the ladies who latched on the show latched onto it for that theme of this man who was 400 years old and has had to say goodbye to so many people while he just never ages and just keeps moving on and the interesting thing is I also mentioned to Josh about the situation and he actually told me that if I started to develop sores on my feet to the crown of my head that I better let him know right away and some of you probably recognize that from the book of Job. Um, hasn't happened yet Josh. <laughs> uh, so as I was searching for, I, I started to search for answers so I just started to to look through God's word just to find something that would explain what was going on and, and I was some, I just opened my Bible randomly and I suddenly found myself in Isaiah 55, which reads, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And it wasn't really the explanation I was looking for, so I looked again and I found myself in Isaiah 66, where it said, Thus the Lord says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. Still wasn't really getting the answer I was looking for, so I looked again, and this time I found myself in Job 38. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the, the earth's foundation? And at, at that point, I, I kind of stopped because I was getting the, the impression that it, this, this isn't really for you to figure out, just, just accept what I've done. And I, I just, I couldn't leave it alone. So I eventually started to search even more, which, which takes us to our first verse uh, in John, or our first passage, which is in John chapter 11, starting in verse one. And I'll read it for you. So I'm gonna be, uh, switching between different translations. I like to use the NIV, I like to use the ESV, and sometimes I like to use the Amplified version, which will show up on the screen. So I'll read the text for you. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So I'll, I'll just give you an idea of, of where we are. So it's probably just a few days before the Passover feast. And in the preceding chapter, John chapter 10, 
which takes place during the Feast of Dedication, which we know as Hanukkah, Jesus um, had told the people there that he was the good shepherd and also that he and the Father were one, and the Jews were threatening to stone him. So he withdrew to what's called the Transjordan, which is just east of the Jordan River, so it's the northern portion of the Dead Sea. It's about one day's walk from Jerusalem, estimated to be about 20 miles. And this was actually the area where John the Baptist was baptizing people. And it's here that the Lord Jesus Christ gets word that Lazarus is sick. And Lazarus and his sisters lived in a small town of Bethany, which is roughly about two miles east of Jerusalem. And Mary, it's written, was the one who poured expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. And as a side note, more likely, this Mary is not the same woman that's mentioned in Luke chapter 7, who cried tears over the Lord's feet and then wiped those tears with her hair and then anointed his feet with ointment from a flask that she carried. A majority of the scholars agree that, that these are actually two different, Mary, or two different women. And Mary's mention in this passage is someone who loved to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to his teachings, while her sister Martha was the one who was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made because Jesus was at their home. And you'll probably recognize this verse, or these verses, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Oops, sorry. Oops, okay, I don't have that passage there. Um, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So these are the sisters of Lazarus. So when Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, the first words out of his mouth aren't, let's go to him quickly. He, he doesn't say that at all. He, he stays in the Transjordan for another two days before heading back and it was dangerous for him to go back because people were waiting to stone him based on what he had said a few months earlier. But he, after two days, he decides to go back anyway. And when you look at the circumstances surrounding this, it seems impossible because he's, it's, gonna t it's two days since he received word that Lazarus was sick. Lazarus has probably already passed away. And we know modern science tells us that decomposition starts to occur about 24 hours to 72 hours after death. But these events came into play because Jesus was to be glorified. Or to bring us back roughly to the main theme, the illness that Lazarus had, it wasn't about Lazarus or, or, the, or that death would win, but that God would be glorified through this. So how does this glorify God? Well, God is glorified when we acknowledge his greatness. So when Lazarus, who had been decomposing in the tomb for at least two days walked out of the tomb as, it, as if he'd never died in the first place. There was no doubt amongst the people that they were in the presence of God, that Jesus was the son of God, that he was God. And that's what glory means. Uh, one of the definitions is glory means high renown or honor won by notable achievements. So the purpose of Lazarus' death was so that the son of man would be glorified through Lazarus' resurrection. God's glory was on display when Lazarus walked out of that tomb, physical death was conquered, a decomposing body was reconstituted, and a dead man walked out of the tomb. And Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb not because he wanted Lazarus to live again physically. We know that he deeply cared for Lazarus, but Lazarus' resurrection was actually secondary compared to God's glory. That sounds kind of strange, but this is who God is. This is why he does what he does. And, and before we're tempted to think that this is just something in the New Testament, let me take you now to Ezekiel chapter 36, starting in verse 22 and 23, where the Lord God says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been among them, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. And I, I have to admit here that when I read this verse, the first words out of my mouth, and I'm sorry to say this, were, were that God has a big head. And, and, then, and then I thought this... God is like a, is a self-absorbed narcissist, and I was actually waiting for the, for the ceiling in my apartment to explode 
and fire rained down on me, but, but we know, obviously I'm still here, <laughs> but, but we know that, that we can approach God with honest questioning. And, 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 he, and, and when we ask him honestly, he answers us honestly as well. And he, he has every right to glorify himself because he's God, right? I mean, I, he created us. I didn't self-create myself. Um, his handiwork is everywhere in nature, stars in the sky, the, the mountains. I can't say I've done anything comparable. And I could create a portrait of Trinidad, um, but I'm just capturing an image who she is. I didn't create her. The Lord God created her, and I'm just freezing that moment in time and capturing it in a photograph. And, and re really, no matter what we create or, or what we build or construct it, it's kind of been done before already, if, if you think about it. And I've taken pictures of the sunset, but so has everyone else. I've taken pictures of the moon or planes flying in front of the moon, and so have thousands of other people. I think in the, in the past five years since I got into photography, I've taken over 3, uh, 300,000 shots. And none of them is, is really unique, actually. It's, those shots have been done before of people, of landscapes, of nature. Um, of objects as well, and, and I came to a sobering realization when I was thinking about this that, that um, God is the only one who can truly create. We're just building off of, off of what he has already given us. So why did God want to protect his holy name, his reputation among the nations of the world? Like he's, he's God, right? But, and it was for the simple reason that if God didn't act, to protect his name, this would lead other nations to the conclusion that the pagan gods were more powerful than the God of Israel. Because for centuries, the, is, the Israelites were claiming uh, and, and proclaiming that they knew the one true living God. But then they suddenly find themselves in exile, their land is destroyed. And the other nations were saying, well, if Israel followed the only living and true God, then where is he now? Did he just ghost the Israelites and, and suddenly they, they didn't hear from him? Or why would he allow them to be conquered and exiled? Because it was the same God who, who parted the Red Sea. It was the same God who sent a, ten plagues upon Egypt. It was the same God who rained down fire from heaven because Elijah prayed and suddenly he's not there, um, at least from the perspective of the other nations. And since he couldn't rescue his people from exile, the conclusion of these other nations would have been that the God of Israel was a weakling who couldn't protect his people from being conquered and that he could be conquered just as his people were conquered. But that's, that's not to say that the, the Israelites didn't deserve what happened to them as far as exile. The reason they were exiled and dispersed was because of their own actions. Uh, in, in verse 18 uh, in Ezekiel, it actually cites two crimes bloodshed and idolatry. But in Ezekiel 34, the prophet actually criticizes Israel's leaders for looking after themselves and not the people. The leaders, religious and otherwise, looked to their own interests and had neglected their service to others. And as a result, God was pushed off to the side and the people who depended on the leaders were abandoned. So Israel's exile was well-deserved. And Israel was, was actually scattered. The, the people of the northern nation of Israel were exiled by the Assyrians in 722. And those territories that they once called their own were now occupied by other people who were conquered. And the southern kingdom, Judea, had been exiled from the Holy Land three times in, six, from, in 605, 598, and 586 BC, and they were exiled by the Babylonians. They ended up being dispersed to northern Africa, to eastern Iran, and into Europe. And the land of Judea was in ruins. Its cities were burned and destroyed, and, and, the, un, and the uncultivated farmlands that they had we're turning back into wilderness. So to preserve his holy name, what does God do? He decides to act. Not because they deserved it, Israel did deserve exile, but because of his holy name. And what he's doing is something that we do ourselves, right? When we've been maligned, when, we've, when our reputation is in doubt, you want to clear your name, you want to redeem your name. And we've, we've all been spoken of in, in, in that way. You know, we've all been victims of rumors and misunderstandings. And sometimes those rumors and misunderstandings blossom into, into huge stories that grow out of control. And sometimes those stories aren't true. And I'm actually thinking of someone who I know who, um, her husband 
got a job uh, overseas. And so they decided to pack up and take their two kids with them and move to that other country. But it wasn't very long before her husband had decided that he was in love with someone else. And so he told his wife and two kids, pack up your stuff and go back home to the U.S. because I'm going to stay with this woman. And I, I can, I, you can just imagine what, what this lady I know is, is going through right now. Rumors are starting to spread. People are talking about it. And she has to live with that shame of, of what happened. And when something like that happens to us, we want to set the record straight. We don't want to go through life with those stories hanging over our heads. Many of you are, are probably familiar with Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, which is about the Salem witch trials. And the protagonist, uh, John Proctor, is falsely accused and put on trial for being a witch. And he's asked to sign his name to a, to a false confession, which he refuses. And, and before, before he's hanged, spoiled the ending for you, to, for those who haven't read it, he, <laughs> he says the following, and I, I'm going to condense it a bit. He says, you will not use me. I have three children. How may I teach them to walk like men in the world? And I sold my friends. You were the high court. Your word is good enough. Tell them I confess myself. Say Proctor broke his knees and wept like a woman. Say what you will. What others say and what I sign is to is not the same. I mean to deny nothing because it is my name, because I cannot have another in my life, because I lie and sign myself to lies, because I am not worth the dust on the feet of them that hang. How may I live without my name? I have given you my soul. Leave me my name. And we know what that's like, right? We, we've seen it, we've felt it, we've lived it. And much like John Proctor, on a much larger scale, the Lord God wanted to protect his holy name. But the beauty of this passage in Ezekiel is that, yes, God is going to act for the sake of his holy name. But as a result of that, God is going to reconstitute his people and bring them back to the land. And not just that, he's going to do a lot more. He's going to redeem them because their redemption brings glory to his holy name. So he writes, or it's written, in the following verses, where the Lord God says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. So we go from God saying, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, and I will vin vindicate my holiness before their eyes, to a promise where he says, I will take you from the nations and gather you. I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will remove your heart of stone. I'll I will put my spirit within you. I will be your God. I will deliver you. See, the ultimate purpose of God's plan for Israel, and the plan for rescue and redemption, was so that the whole world would know that there is only one true God. And he actually says in Isaiah 48, For my name's sake I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. So our God will not share glory with anything or anyone else. And he's not just speaking to the people of Israel 3,000 years ago. He's, he's speaking to us today because no matter how impure your life may seem right now, God is offering you a fresh start. Your sins can be washed away, like the rain washing, washing the dust off, off of the car and making it look pristine. Um, you can receive a new heart for God, and you can have his spirit within you. And you don't have to patch up your old life. 
because you have a new one. And why? Because we were created for God's glory. So it's in Ephesians chapter 1, it's written, just as in his love he chose us in Christ, actually selected us for himself as his own before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy, that is consecrated, set apart for him, purpose-driven and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself as his own, children through Jesus Christ, in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace and favor. And then further on in that chapter, it's written, In him also we have received an inheritance, a destiny we were, we were claimed by God as his own, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, who, put, who first put our confidence in him as our Lord and Savior, would exist to the praise of his glory. And again, just further on, in him you also, when you heard the, tr the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, and as a result believed in him, were stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, the one promised by Christ as owned and protected by God. The Spirit is guaranteed the first installment, the pledge, a foretaste of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own purchased possession, his believers, to the praise of his glory. And finally, in Isaiah 43, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Your new life in Christ and your, and your redemption because of the blood of Christ brings glory to God's holy name. Like, like the Israelites who were, who were scattered because of their sin, so were we. Living in, the, in this world and because of our sin, and living in the wilderness of this world because of our sin. But like Lazarus, we've been brought back from the dead and raised to life because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we read about Lazarus being raised from the dead because it brought glory to, the, to Jesus and also to God the Father, is actually much more. First, because Lazarus' death doesn't, actually, doesn't end with his death and rising from the dead. The story continues to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and his rising from the dead. And second, because after this miracle, the Sanhedrin had gathered and they plotted to kill Jesus, but according to John chapter 12, they also plotted to kill Lazarus because Lazarus was proclaiming the good news. And many Jews were, st were beginning to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. Because we were created for God's glory to spread the good news, just like Lazarus. In Matthew chapter 5, it's written, You are the light of Christ to the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence and recognize and honor and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we're supposed to be a city on a hill and the light of the world. Being here on the coast, I like to think of the analogy of the lighthouse and the lighthouse which beams out and or blasts its foghorn in bad weather to warn ships that they could be dangerously close to a rough coast. But we tend to lose that characteristic often, don't we? When the pressure of the world comes, comes knocking at our door, we, we tend to clam up. Or, or instead of saying something, we, we give in to the madness of the crowd. Or, or some people, out of fear, they deny the light, like Peter did when he denied Christ. And sometimes we can stifle the light by ignoring the needs of others. But oftentimes when we think that we're the light of the world, what do we normally think of? We, that we think that maybe we have to be perfect. That, and, and we all find it daunting that we have to be this light that shines and, and never burns out. That we have to be this bright, self-sustaining light for all to see. But I think that's, that's maybe where we need to think about the, the verse uh, uh, the, a little more, and that's why I like the Amplified Version where it says, you are the light of Christ to the world. So as a photographer, I know a little about light. I know how to shape light around a person when I, when I take their portrait and take a pleasing portrait, but I also know that true light is clean and it's pure. And I am not clean and I am not pure. And it's even more sobering, um, actually, when I realize that 
while God wants us to glorify him, I actually don't add anything to God's glory. Um, so how can I live with this expectation of being a light to the world in the city on a hill? And hopefully many of you have been able to get away from the big city and at least escape to someplace rural, away from the city lights. And when you're out there on a cloudless night and it's a full moon, can you actually navigate without a flashlight? Probably, and many of you who've actually tried to do that, in the light of the full moon, you can actually see. Um, and the moon is not a light source in itself. The moon reflects the light of the sun. And so should we. Jesus is the light of the world, and the Holy Spirit encourages us to be more Christ-like, to reflect the likeness of Christ. So we, we should reflect the likeness of Christ such that, and John MacArthur basically says it best, the goal of my life should be to so live that when, God, that when people know me well enough, they would say God is glorious. Not John is glorious, but God is glorious. When we reflect the Son, we reflect his qualities, his, his nature, his love, his goodness, and his sacrifice. God is glorified because it, it doesn't become about us, it becomes about him. But this still didn't answer my question, why? Why, after all these years, these past three years, I felt like the Highlander with people passing on or getting sick, and I'm still here. And why God didn't save them, heal them of, of the depression that they had or the illnesses that they had or, or the loneliness that they had or fix their broken hearts. And one actually, and what was interesting is um, one of the people who passed away this past summer, his name was Ray, he was a colleague of mine. And um, at his memorial service, they, they talked about him as, as, they, as most people would at a memorial service. And it was said that he glorified God through his life. He glorified God with the way he raised the children. He glorified God through the way he, he treated other people. And I've shared at least twice, I know once, the story of, of my own mother um, and her battle with cancer. Uh, but I wanted to share it again because about half of you have heard it and the other half haven't. And I was actually reminded of it yesterday because I suddenly realized, looking at my journal, that yesterday, three years ago, was the day when she received her diagnosis that she had an incurable cancer and that she only had about four months left. And the cancer that she had was a very aggressive and deadly form of cancer that actually grew several millimeters in the space of about six days. And there's, like I said, there's no known cure. And it was a Monday night, uh, April 3rd, 2017, where her hospice nurse pulled me aside and said to me, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't have that much time left. And the following morning, it was about 5 a.m., and I just, I burst awake with a sense of urgency, an urgency to go talk to her and ask her who Jesus was. And when I did, when I went to her room, she was alone because she knew her time was, was short as well. And I asked her, Mom, is, is Jesus your savior? Is he your healer? At which point she closed her eyes and she raised her arms into the air and said, yes. Yes, he is. So in, in her final hours, with all of heaven, heaven listening, my mom glorified the Lord Jesus Christ by acknowledging who he was, he was her savior. And, and it seems like such a small thing because we were the only human beings in, in the room, but ultimately it is between you and, and between God and those who acknowledge God and acknowledge his glory, that, that glorifies him. And, and some of you may be hearing this for the first time, some of you may be hearing this for the second time, and other people have heard it as well. But I, I don't hesitate to tell the story because because in her final hours, my mom glorified God by acknowledging who he was. And I want to spread that news as well. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 just remind us to trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And like so many others who I knew, that they too use their lives to glorify God. They, they acknowledged him and they, they trusted him. And... and that should be one of the things we do. We should acknowledge, trust the Lord, trusting him that he will take us on paths that sometimes we may not take, but his path is the best for us. Just a few takeaways. 
So in, in sickness or in health or wherever you are in life right now, do you, do you know who God is in your life? Would, would you trust him regardless of how your life is going? You know, in, in what you do, do you acknowledge who God really is and do you give him the glory he deserves? Or are you like more like Mary or are you more like Martha? Do you, do you spend time sitting at his feet and listening to his teaching, spend time in his word? Or are you too busy or are you too distracted by what's going on in the world? Do you fret, reflect the light of Christ in the world? We, we glorify God knowing full well that we'll be in heaven with him in the presence of his glory and acknowledging him because of who he is and what he's done is, is just a taste of things to come. And the end of your story, when that eventually comes, it isn't, it isn't death. The end of your story is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because every day we're here on earth is, is a day, like Michael said, to be thankful. It's a day to be thankful because without Jesus, we would be eternally separated from God. Because what, whatever you're dealing with, it's, it's not what you're going through that brings glory to God. It, it's not the ordeal that brings glory to God. It's the end result. And as we endure those times, may we be like Job and say, as he did in Job chapter 1, verse 21, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord.